One of the things you should all be able to do is for some description of a function or a problem or a language, be able to prove whether that's computable or not. If the question doesn't tell you which, you've got to have some intuition about which is the right one to try to do. So what are the strategies that you can use in general? If you want to prove something is computable and that something could be a function, Usually when we talk about languages, we use the decidable, undecidable terminology, but we're going to use those to mean basically the same thing. So yeah, what, are the, what do we do to show something is computable? Rice's theorem. Okay, so we could use Rice's theorem. That is mostly helpful for showing us things that are uncomputable. Good, yes. The most natural way to prove something is computable is a construction. If you can show how to make a machine that computes it, there's an implied in this question, computable by a Turing machine. If we asked if this is computable by a circuit or by a finite state machine, that would be a different thing you have to construct. But what you have to do is construct some machine that computes, let's say, a function f. And what does it mean to have a machine that computes it? Well, it has to for all possible inputs, produce the correct answer. Right? And that means it always finishes and it always produces the right answer. Yeah, question? Good question, yeah. So what does it mean to do a construction proof? So if our goal is to show a Turing machine, would it be enough to show a Python program? What would make you really convinced that the answer, if, if you show a function, show Python code that computes it, that that's a satisfactory answer to prove something is computable by a Turing machine? Yeah. So how do we know that? How do we know that anything we can construct in a Python program, we could also write in the Turing machine? To show that something is computable by a Turing machine, if we're going to do it by writing something else, we've got to show that whatever we did that something else in, we can simulate with the Turing machine. So if we can write a Python program and we can show that there is a Turing machine that simulates Python, so once we've shown that there's a Turing machine that can simulate Python, then anything that we can do in Python, we can also do with a Turing machine because we can simulate Python with that Turing machine. If we wanted to show the opposite, we'd have to show if we could show writing a Python program that simulates a Turing machine. That would mean anything that we can do with a Turing machine, we can also do with Python. At least in our idealized version of Python, we could do both. Right? That would show that they're equivalent. But if our goal is to show something is computable, we just need the one direction. If your goal is to show something is computable, and you say, well, I know that I can write a Turing machine that simulates Python, then I can show my computability proof by writing a Python program, because I know that there's a Turing machine that would simulate that. It's easier to write Python code than to write Turing machine code. That's the usual way we're going to prove something is computable is by construction, by showing a way to compute it. And that doesn't necessarily mean we know the specific code or we know the specific Turing machine description, but we know that there's a way to make it. So what about proving something is uncomputable? If we're going to prove uncomputability, what do we have to do? Yeah. So we have two main strategies. One is contradiction. We're showing that if we could compute this, something impossible would result. And the other main strategy is, it's also kind of contradiction proof, is to say, here's something we know is uncomputable that we could build if we had this. This is a, a special kind of contradiction. So we have to do a reduction that shows some problem that we already know is uncomputable. And any problem that you already know is uncomputable can be used for this. Let's try an example. Is addition computable? What would your intuition tell you? It would tell you probably yes. The other thing it should tell you is, well, define addition. We can't answer a question about whether something's computable or not unless it's defined in some precise way. So we better define addition. How should we define addition? How do we define a function? Yeah. Good. So let's assume we've got a mathematical, we've got the mathematical definition of addition already. Let's, let's assume we have plus defined on the naturals. We know plus is a function that takes two naturals in and it outputs a natural. And that function is defined and we have a good notion of what addition means. If we're asking is it computable by a Turing machine, we've got to define it as a function that 
makes sense to a Turing machine. So we've got to say what the input is. What is the input to a Turing machine? Is it two natural numbers? It's got to be something that we can encode on a tape with a finite sequence of symbols. So we've got to describe the input, and the input, if we're being careful, right, so the input is some string of zeros and ones, or maybe we could add some other symbols to our alphabet. Right, maybe it's going to be useful if we add a plus symbol. And let's say it's of the form, the sequence, we've got all the, the little a's and little b's are zeros or ones, and we're using our special plus symbol to separate them. Okay, so that's our input. And now we've got to say what the output should be. So how will we define the output? Well, we want at the end of the machine execution, the tape's going to contain, and now we're going to say, like, these are binary representations of naturals. And then the output is going to be the binary representation, A plus B, where that plus is the natural number plus. So if we want to ask a question whether something's computable by a Turing machine, we've got to define a problem. We've got to define the inputs and what the required property the output should have. Now we've got that definition. How do we prove it's computable? Yeah. So certainly this is one where it would be nice to have a Python program rather than a Turing machine. But it should also raise the little questions of how if we built our Turing machine to simulate Python, it would need to include a way to simulate what plus does in Python. We're sort of offloading all the complexity of this to assuming this Turing machine that implements Python exists, and we haven't actually done that. If we didn't want to do that, we'd have to get some sort of intuition of, well, if we're going to do add as a Turing machine, we're going to start with this, this as the input. Writing a full Turing machine like this would probably take longer than you have for the exam and is not that interesting, but you, you should have a sense that you could do it. Well, you've got to probably look for the number before the plus, so you're going to have something that's going to move right without changing it until you see the plus, and then you're going to move left, and then based on whether that's a zero or a one, you're going to probably have to erase that with something and start moving right. You're going to move right to the end. Maybe we should put an equals in there so it ends up looking like a, a nice output or we could change, change how we do it. And then you're going to need to keep track of these states and you're going to end up with sort of another copy of all these states for when you had a carry. And then you're going to get to some output based on if this was a zero or this was a one, you're going to write a zero or a one. That would be really tedious to do the whole machine. But that would be a proof that is computable that you are convinced you could do it and it's always going to work.